Adi Sadun Bharti and we are here at Voice Summit in New Jersey and today we have with us Nathan Tolor. You are president and co-founder of Orbita. First of all, tell us a bit about the company itself. Sure. Uh, Orbit is a software company based in Boston, Massachusetts. And we work with healthcare organizations across the industry to tap into the power and potential of voice and other conversational technologies to drive applications for patient engagement, remote patient monitoring, um, in-facility care, any use case where it's about reaching the patient in a most natural uh, and authentic and conversational way as possible. Since you're one of the co-founders of the company, I'm curious when and why you founded the company? Yeah, well, um, we founded the company because, uh, well, you know, personal circumstances allowed us to do so, but also because we saw an opportunity uh, to apply these next generation technologies to improve the way patients are cared for. Digital health technology has been around for a long time. Mobile apps, um, web portals for healthcare have been around for quite a while. And what we wanted to do is to say, how can new technologies like uh, Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, provide a way for patients to be more informed, more uh, engaged in their own care and better uh, to ultimately achieve better outcomes and lower cost of care. And uh, also say on a personal level, I have aging parents and um, I had given my parents a uh, Google Home device a couple years ago. And I saw how they were able to use it in ways that they weren't able to use regular digital technology. So it occurred to me, hey, this is technology, digital technology, advanced digital technology that a population of people who normally wouldn't be able to use it are able to use. That's transformative. So that was one of the motivations right there. And I totally agree with you. Uh, I have two kids, like one is three, and and they will, the smaller one has a Google, and yes. then you say, and Google listens. Yeah, you can make phone calls, you can, and they ask a lot yeah. of questions. Sometimes they ask jokes also, and they laugh at, mm -hmm. but uh, as you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of things, because it's not, uh, it, it's basically using a computer. Yeah. The power of computer, but you have to use at a level where not everybody can use it. Yeah. So it's like kind of democratizing computer. And In a way, it is, yeah. 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 It, it's, um, the voice is one of the first things you learn to communicate exactly. with. It's one of the last things you lose, actually. And the fact that we are interfacing with digital technology now through the power of our voice is where the transformation comes from, right? And um, it, what we've seen is that the ability for very young children, in your example, I have a niece who's two and a half years old and is able to use Alexa. Right. Um, to octogenarians, the ability for them to use their voice to control a digital experience is there. It's been demonstrated. So now the question becomes, how do you apply it um, to care management scenarios? How do you apply it to um, uh, clinical efficiency? That's what we do. Right. Yeah, so we, we, we talked about, you know, in general, you know, how voice is helping. But you are working in a specific niche, which yeah. is healthcare. So, so First of all, just, you know, how voice, you know, you gave example of your aging parents, but there are a lot of other people who are, like, not capable of a lot of things, or they cannot move, or they can, so yeah. how, how does voice change the whole, you know, the way they interact? Can you talk about that before we move into technology part? Sure. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, vision impairment. Right. It seems almost obvious, but maybe not. For me, it was interesting because I didn't really think about it until I saw a vision impaired person using a voice experience. If you can't see, then your options for interfacing with digital technology are your hands or your, your voice. And um, so it's an accessibility use case, right? And uh, people have been using Siri for a few years now to be able to interact with digital experiences. But the problem is that with Siri, you need to know where your mobile phone is and, um, or otherwise have access to it. Uh, the power of these smart speakers is that they can be hands-free and accessible in the room that you're in. And so that introduces some possibilities that didn't exist even just a few years ago. Um, other use cases for accessibility are people who are wheelchair bound, uh, may have lost the use of their arms for whatever reason. And so it's not just aging. And then the final one, it's, it, it can be just a health and wellness tool. 
So somebody who's struggling with a chronic condition that may need reminders of when they're supposed to take their medication or when they're supposed to do their therapy, and then have a virtual assistant that can walk them through their therapy. Another use case we worked on um, not long ago was related to respiratory uh, ailments. So if you have COPD, you may be going through a therapy for training of your lungs and training of breathing. So respiratory training um, is uh, a good use case because you can have the voice assistant coach you. Okay, for the next three seconds, I want you to breathe in and then I want you to breathe out, that sort of thing. So the use cases are quite varied. Uh, we work with um, a couple major healthcare systems and both of them have told us that they have over 100 use cases for voice just within their facilities and for remote patients. So the um, problem is not use uh, the technology, it's really identifying those high value use cases and where to apply it. What kind of adoption is already there of voice assisted healthcare? Uh, what stage, what phase you know, of adoption is there is yeah. it early? It's already there? We have what we call a maturity model for voice and healthcare. And it's fair to say we're still quite early. Uh, most of the applications are oriented around patient education, just informational services. You can go on to the Alexa skill store and find examples of educational applications in healthcare. Um, so that's sort of stage one. And we're moving into ones that are, I will call more clinical. A clinical application might um, offer some advice or some coaching and for, uh, beyond just answering questions. And then the next stage beyond that is personalized care experiences where some information about the patient is known. And when you get into that realm, you're getting into the realm of privacy and security. Yes. And in this country, uh, regula regulations like HIPAA come to bear. So the good news is just this year, in April of this year, Amazon announced a HIPAA-eligible version of Amazon Alexa, which has opened up more opportunity for building these more clinical applications where protected health information may be exchanged mm -hmm. with the assurances that it will be pre uh, protected and secured. So um, uh, I would say we're still early, but the floodgates are really starting to open with respect to applications um, particularly around these clinical use cases mm -hmm. where it's uh, uh, symptom tracking and care, remote care management. Um, in between there, there are still a whole slew of applications that don't necessarily require the personalization or have uh, HIPAA regulation elements to them. Things like resource finding, um, uh, schedule tracking, um, like I said, question answering, all these types of things can be done through an anonymous experience that doesn't require identifying a user. Mm -hmm. But we're really on the cusp of uh, a whole new set of use cases that are much more clinical. I don't know if you can talk about it, but are there any you know, uh, institutes or organizations or where it's, you know, your technology are being used already? So the Mayo Clinic is using us uh, to deliver a question answering experience mm -hmm. around first aid content, and we're expanding that to other uh, content. Um, we work with the Brigham and Women's Hospital on a couple innovation projects related to remote patient care. Uh, some of those have a voice component, some of them are voice and chat. Uh, so a chat bot is really a conversational agent mm -hmm. that just doesn't necessarily have to respond to voice. You can interface with it with text. And in fact, we do just as many chat bot applications as we do voice because in the end, it's about designing a conversational assistant that can talk with you, listen to you, respond intelligently to your uh, requests, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's done through voice or chat. Um, and then in, the, um, you know, in, in other domains, we are working with major pharmaceutical companies who are using us for uh, um, clinical trial applications, helping patients stay engaged in their clinical trial program, and um, post-prescription brand applications where um, a particular drug has a digital experience for the patients who are prescribed to that drug. It's designed to ensure that they adhere to their medication, designed to ensure that they're educated about their condition, et cetera. The way we look at it, you know, that uh, uh, healthcare and voice, there's a lot of opportunities there, you know. This is, a, this is kind of uh, a solution that, you know, is needed. But I'm pretty sure there are a lot of challenges also, oh, sure. unique challenges that this. Can you talk about that? Well, one of them we just talked about, which is the privacy and security. The regulations in healthcare are, are quite strict, and they mm -hmm. should be. Uh, when someone's uh, handing over information about their healthcare, um, you know, there's been a number of uh, news stories related to breaches of healthcare data, and nobody wants to see that. Um, 
you know, just from a practical point of view, we all want our privacy protected. But on the regulatory side, healthcare companies are quite cautious and appropriately so about the exchange of privacy, private data um, generally, but especially through voice, because there's still some unknowns. I, I wouldn't say they're unknowns. There's some naivete and um, learnings about the use of voice experiences. Um, what happens when somebody is talking to an Alexa device or a Google device? How do you assure that whoever's talking is who they say they are? So this authentication problem. There are solutions to it, but these are questions that come up when we're out there talking to healthcare systems uh, and healthcare companies. They want to understand how do we ensure that we're compliant with the data privacy and security regulations not just as industry standards, but often the healthcare organizations have their own regular, their own compliance requirements that are even more strict than what the government would put forth. In addition to privacy, uh, are, there, are there any other either technical or you know, social or human issues also? Or, yeah. Uh, or well, that is the major. I, yeah. Um, well, when you're talking about voice specifically and you're talking about smart speakers, um, uh, they're generally designed uh, most use cases have been designed to be used in the home, in the privacy of your own home. If you take a device like that and put it into a communal setting, right, a, 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 um, um, you know, a, a facility, then you have to be cognizant of the possibility that mul multiple people may be accessing this. So Amazon and Google and others have uh, solutions for these business applications. But depending on what you're trying to accomplish with that voice experience, you just to be very thoughtful about what it means for it to be always on and always listening. And in some cases, you'll see these little kiosks that may have been set up, which allows you to go in like you would go into a phone booth, right? right? right. You, you walk into the phone booth, you close the door, and your voice is protected. So these are considerations. They add complexity to the deployments of any application. But uh, in my opinion, they're not insurmountable. It's just that we're, like you said, we're in a new Right. new era with these technologies. I was curious about one thing personally. Uh, uh, it is related to privacy as well, and that is that uh, uh, connectivity. Yeah. Because everything has to be sent to cloud. Ideally, I would want all the processing to happen locally. Yeah. And then cloud can be either used to sync it or just you know uh, update the models or anything. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, you want that because of uh, privacy or for performance? Privacy, performance, and also <laughs> so that I am in the car, or let's say you know you want to just go on Alps, you know, and they don't have. You want to go and stay on Himalayas, you know, just for. So so I don't want to be tied to a network to be able to use it. Right. Yeah. So so that it should work offline yeah. as well. That is uh, so. Right now, state of the art, and most of the uh, systems that are out there do depend on a network connection. So it is a limitation. And not even just uh, you know traveling to the Himalayas or the Alps. It's in rural America uh, where connectivity True, yes. isn't quite as strong. Um, the good news is that most of these applications, the ones that aren't streaming video, don't require a whole lot of bandwidth. Uh, just to speak to a voice assistant and get a little uh, uh, answer back doesn't require a lot of bandwidth. But you're absolutely right. There are serious limitations when you get outside of areas where connectivity becomes uh, suspect. And um, uh, so that's an emerging area. Yeah. A good example would be maybe there could be a natural catastrophe, disaster where the power is out, mm. net is down, and you are dependent on this device. Yeah, yeah. It, that's more or less like your nanny. That's right. And now you cannot interact with that. Yeah. So well, we have you know we have that bit of that problem even with smartphones yes. now, right? Uh, I mean, you don't. Uh, your life doesn't depend on smartphone. Yeah. But in some cases, like for example, if you're using the machine just to pump insulin or whatever into oh, your... Oh yeah, 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 I see yes. what you mean, yeah. Yes, um, yeah, the, uh, the failover and fault tolerance requirements for those things are extremely high. That's why, you know, if I talked about our maturity right. model, if you talk just about information services on one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum is a, a, a voice assistant that actually prescribe and administer treatment. Right, right. Now you're crossing over into not just uh, data privacy and regular, you're talking about an, FT, uh, an FT, FDC, Federal mm -hmm. um, Drug Commission, you know, uh, FDC level of uh, compliance. Mm -hmm. That crosses into a medical device and the requirements there are much, much stricter. Right. Yeah, you have to have an alternative input mm -hmm. versus just voice.
So, so, yeah, so as wise become more and more kind of part of our lives, you will have to deal with these problems. You will powers. have to deal with yes. it for sure. Uh, thank you so Anything else you'd like to talk about before we wrap no, up? No, I think we captured yeah. everything. Yeah, thank you, Nathan, so much for talking to me today. You too, And I will actually keep in touch to see how things are moving forward. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much.